be going right now any moment. Yeah. Okay. Looks like we are live, just working out the slight time lag. I'll just leave it in this, this view anyway. It's a little bit less confusing also for myself. Okay. Hello everyone. We are live at the first ever environmental physiotherapy roundtable. Uh, welcome to everyone. It's my absolute pleasure and honor to welcome you to um, this uh, live stream event and uh, conversation. I really want to thank everyone for taking time to participate in this. This is to all you speakers, first of all, but also for everyone who might be joining into viewing. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, of course, if you are viewing, uh, a warm welcome to you. Um, I am really excited about this. Uh, I think this is a really great occasion and I look forward to our conversation. Um, just before we start, um, for the viewers, a little bit of minimal housekeeping. Um, it seems that uh, in, if you wanted to join the live chat on YouTube, um, you will need a YouTube channel and that you will need to be signed in with that. I haven't been able to unlock that to make it more publicly available. So we'll have to go with that. Um, if, however, you comment somewhere else, be it on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, or anything of the sort, please use the hashtag environmental physiotherapy. That's hashtag environmental physiotherapy with capital E and capital P. Let's try this. Yeah. Hopefully this is visible. Just leave it there for a moment. Hashtag environmental physiotherapy if you wanted to chat along in some way. And um, basically we would, if you use that, we would really love to hear your thoughts and continue dis the discussion with you after um, our round table. And so using this hashtag will make it easier for us to be able to hear your voice and speak with you and uh, yeah, continue talking. Okay, so at this point, I'm really happy and, uh, and proud to announce today's speakers to you. And um, we'll maybe have a quick wave from everyone uh, as I introduce you, just so uh, viewers can more easily orientate themselves on the screen when we're speaking. So I'll start off with Professor David Nichols, who um, uh, has been instrumental in setting up the Environmental Physiotherapy Association, amongst many other things that he does. Uh, he's from the AUT University in Auckland in New Zealand. A quick wave if you can, Dave. Thank you. All right, next um, I'll introduce Esther Mary Darcy. She is the chair of the European region of the WCPT. I'm very happy to have you here, Esther. Hello, hello. Cool. Next, um, Dr. Cecilia Winberg. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She's the vice president of the Swedish Associ Association of Physiotherapists. And again, we're really happy to have you here. Um, hi, yep. Yeah. Cool. Um, moving on to Dr. Karin Mostert. She's a physiotherapist and associate professor in public health in South Africa. I'm skipping the city here just to be sure. Uh, <laughs> and uh, next then Dr. Jane Kalpen. Um, she's a physiotherapist, of course, as well, and the program leader in the Bachelors of Physical Activity, Health and Wellbeing at Queen Margaret University in Squat Scotland. Um, Right, moving on to Dr. Olivia Stone, whose image you're not seeing because we don't have a camera for her, but she's with us here. Uh, there's a, a wave in thoughts. Um, she's a primatologist as well as a physiotherapist, and she is also the director at the Otago School of Physiotherapy Clinic in Christchurch in New Zealand. Right, moving on, also in New Zealand, Marion Kennedy, a PhD student at the Department of Anatomy at the Otago University um, in Dunedin. Uh, good to have you here, Marion. Um, and right on to the next person, Alma Viviana Silva Guerrero, a PhD candidate uh, originally from Colombia, who is, I believe, doing her uh, PhD in Australia in Sydney. If you could give us a little wave, Viviana. Um, that would be great. Hi, hi. Um, cool. Moving on, Issy Long, a final year physiotherapy student in the UK. Hey, Issy, good to have you. Uh, and also a final year physiotherapy student, although from Germany, uh, is Thies Bunsen. Thies, hi. Thank you. And um, next up, 
up Lucy Inyang Edet. I hope I'm, I pronounced that kind of right. Lucy is a physiotherapist and also a chartered architect, uh, and she's based in Nigeria. Lucy, if you can hear me, just give us a little bit of a wave. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. And finally, um, there's also me. Um, my name is Dr. Philip Marich. I am a physiotherapist, and I suppose I'm something like the founding chair of the Environmental Physiotherapy Association that has launched August this year, and I'm currently based in Norway. So what brings me to uh, environmental physiotherapy personally, just to start from there, is on the one hand, a really simple love and appreciation for the outdoors. And really this matches my love for physiotherapy as well. But on the other, all of this is really uh, also a direct consequence from some of my doctoral research um, and some of the things I explored there. And this exploration really gave me no choice but to turn to connections between physiotherapy and the environment after those studies. So that's in, in very short how I come to this. But um, personal background aside, we find ourselves in a really extremely important moment in healthcare in general, but also in physiotherapy. Climate change and environmental degradation are now widely recognized as the biggest health issue of our time. From the Paris Climate Agreement, the IPC special, IPCC Special Report on Global Warming, the UN Agenda 2030 SDGs, and the recent 2019 report to the Lancet Countdown on Climate Change and Health, it is clearly established by now that, there, that all of these changes that we're facing and the environmental degradation, the climate change and uh, similar environmental issues require immediate action and that the healthcare professions have a critical role in taking action and that this is every health professions and every health professional's business. So correspondingly, we're seeing a growing movement across the healthcare professions in this regard. However, physiotherapy has not really taken this up yet in any kind of large scale. And this is what we've hoped to change with the launch of the Environmental Physiotherapy Association, and now also this roundtable. I should also acknowledge that there are some other efforts out there in the world of physiotherapy, uh, in the world of physiotherapy. And we will promote and provide more info on those in the near future, and, and certainly also in this roundtable. But even with all these combined efforts, we find ourselves at a truly early stage of a practically entirely new and nondescript field for physiotherapy. So what is interesting is that I think this novelty is also a fruitful openness, and this openness an incredible opportunity for action. Meaning, I believe that environmental physiotherapy already is, can, and should be a large variety of things. And I hope that we can shed a light on at least some close and some distant corners of this open field such that we can get accustomed to it a little more and ultimately take action. I should also finally add that the fact that environmental physiotherapy is such a wide open field and simultaneously one that requires everyone's involvement is also why we can, must, and do sit at this table together, physiotherapy clinicians, researchers, students, educators, and professional representatives alike. So that's my short introduction to what we're doing here today. And with that, I will hand over to Dave. Dave, if you can just unmute your microphone and go. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Well, um, thank you, Philip. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you. Huge thank you to Philip for organizing all of this. I was just thinking about an idea that you just put into my head about this wide opening. And there was a phrase that came to my mind, which was that this is so far beyond us. And, and I mean that in two ways here, because first of all, from a physio professional point of view, it's amazing to me to think that it's, we've had more than a hundred years of physiotherapy as a profession, and we haven't previously articulated physiotherapy as an environmental practice formally in some way before, such that it's taken this long for an environmental physio association to form an international group. I wonder whether that to some extent has been made possible by digital technologies like this, which means that we can be co-present all around the world and talk which in a sense is ironic really, because a lot of this technology is one of the main contributors to carbon emissions and the sort of 
hyper um, advancement of, of um, sorry, that's my phone. Not, I haven't got a duck in the room. Sorry. Um, that's very professional, isn't it? Um, so this kind of hyper advancement is problematic on the one hand, but also it's an opportunity. And I think this touches on what Philip was saying here about the, the massive nature of the problem, but also the massive nature of the opportunity and the opening to, to possibilities that this, this, this offers. In the editorial that Philip and I wrote, one of the points that we wanted to make really strongly was that the environment has always already part of physiotherapy. It always was in physiotherapy. Um, but to me, this raises a really interesting question because if, you th if we think that, if we accept that the environment was always already there, then the, then the question was that at what point did it appear to be separated? How did it get separated away such that we now seem to be wanting to bring it back in in some way? Um, how was it removed? Who did that? I mean, I think we know the answer is we're all doing it all the time. But in what what mechanisms do we do we pursue each day, each week, through our policies and our teaching programs and our clinic work that continually tease the environment away and in some way separate it out from physiotherapy, such that we now have to go through this process of bringing it back in, and then. And then added to that is the question for me is, is, are we bringing it back in? Because if I'm saying, and I think Philip and I are both saying this in the editorial, that it's already there, then what are we trying to do? Are we trying to add it? Um, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, it's already there. Or are we trying to locate it and find it and, and bring it out from under some kind of that it's been sitting under some matting all these years and now we can lift the mat away and there it is. I think this is important because it defines to some extent the nature of our project. If our project is to connect something that was always there, then that feels a bit different to trying to invent something anew. If it's about connecting things in again, then we need to do some work to find it in every corner of physiotherapy and really point it out to people and say to people, look, you're already, physiother physiotherapy, physical therapy is already a very environmental practice. We know, for instance, that physical rehabilitation and physical therapies, when they're effective, they can be a lot less environmentally damaging than expensive technocratic surgery, um, lots of um, MRI scans and CT scans, um, lots of very, um, medicalized interventions which are both costly economically but also costly environmentally sometimes the work we do with our heads and our hands is is very has a very low carbon footprint and by getting people to be active um, getting them outside planting lettuces actually could make a really useful contribution to their health and the broader health of their communities and um, the broader environment so I think I just wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, this question of that, that being and the environmental issues are so far beyond us, I think is really quite important. On the one hand, it says to me that the environmental issues we're now facing seem so massive that what can we do as individuals or as a professional group? What can the EPA do to really change the climate catastrophe that we are hurtling towards. So in that sense, it feels like it's so far beyond us. It also feels to me a little so far beyond us in as much as I believe that the environment is always already within physiotherapy, but it feels like it's estranged in some way. It feels like it's out there somewhere over there. And I feel like there's a, there's some work to be done to, to bring it back in or to, to, to bring it out from under this matting that's been We've suppressed it for a long time, and I think we can stop doing that now. So welcome to the meeting. Thank you again, Philip, for the uh, lovely welcome and the inspiration to get this group going. And I look forward to hearing uh, what everybody else has to say. Thanks, Dave. It's fantastic. I just have to correct a small blunder I made in the beginning in the introduction of everyone. Uh, Amanda Stevens, a physiotherapist from Canada, also needs introduction. She just waved to everyone. 
Uh, sorry about that, Amanda. Um, you're, of course, also here, and I appreciate it very much. And um, I think that I got an, a hand raised from Lucy. Uh, is that correct, Lucy? Uh, I saw a piece of paper or something. Um, maybe no, maybe yes. Not, not yet, please. Not yet. Okay, that's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Anybody give me a wave if you want to say something following up on myself and Dave. Yep, Esther, um, you can turn on your microphone and I'll mute mine. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Philip, and, and thank you, um, Dave, for that introduction. Um, I think, just want to say that it's hugely exciting um, to be a part of this, and, and thank you to both of you and to the other members of the board um, for, for establishing this and, and for, for um, setting up this, this today. Um, may I just make a few points is to start? Or to, is that okay? Absolutely, please. Yeah, so, yes. okay, okay, fine. Um, so <laughs> the two of you talked about your, about your background. And I, I suppose just my background, um, obviously as a physiotherapist, I always had a feeling that we had an environmental aspect to our work. Um, I happened to be uh, married to an environmentalist and I always felt that there was other connections. Um, he had come across this whole idea of nature deficit disorder uh, in, in, in children. Um, on a wonderful book by uh, Love, um, and the idea of actually bringing children out not only to be in nature, but the, for me, the idea was about the activity um, um, as well. My background is in health promotion, and my work was about empowering individuals to take up a healthier lifestyle. And uh, I live in a country that's, that's very wet and probably getting wetter due to um, um, climate change. And the whole aspect of trying to empower people to actually go out regardless of the weather and that it really is just a case of inappropriate clothing um, and so that we can't use that excuse. So that, that was about uh, empowerment. I think also you talked about uh, the development and, and the, the fact it's always been there, but I think we've really moved as physiotherapists very much from that biomedical model to the or sorry to medical model to the biopsychosocial model and I think this fits in very well with the whole environmental physiotherapy approach and um, tied into that really are the sustainable development goals and I think as physiotherapists we probably have a role in every single one of them and um, we, can, we can make an impact. I think it's also interesting to look at uh, how seriously in recent times the doctors have taken this issue. Um, the organization um, called uh, Wonka, which is the Association of GPs and Family Physicians, has a wonderful um, paper um, on, on, on climate change and really worth reading. And the, the doctors in the environment produced a paper on the cancer of climate change, which again is, 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 is worth reading. Um, I, I just think we've got to take on this whole issue of planetary health. And I think um, just two points um, with my connection from Europe to the WCPT, um, I think that this is um, a channel that we should work. And it was interesting that at the last general meeting of WCPT in May, that the Japanese Physical Therapy Association actually put forward a motion that was um, appro uh, approved by the general meeting, so by 101 countries around the world, um, about developing appropriate resources in support of raising awareness and the impact of global warming and climate change. So I think that's a very strong uh, piece um, um, for, for, for us, and I, I hope to be able to maybe work um, perhaps as a, as a go-between with, with, with all of that. And um, lastly, I just want to say that um, I would always end on the hope on, on the on the hope note, and I think that we mustn't underestimate, as my husband and I have often spoken about, the ingenuity of the human being, and that while we are in a crisis, there are also solutions to a lot of this, and I think that we and the Environmental Physiotherapy Association can be part of this. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Fantastic, thank you, Esther. Um... That was really good. Um, Cecilia, um, you're welcome to go next if you just unmute your microphone. And, uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I will also like to agree with Esther. Thank you very much for the opportunity for participating in this evening. I have started with excusing me for my English, but 
I hope you will all understand me. I'm I'm thinking about what you said, Dave. You said that uh, it was so far beyond us, and I also like to follow on what Esther said that maybe we have a uh, we have been striving to. Um, be something else and maybe we have been striving to be working in a more biomedical setting and trying to be more like the doctors instead of focusing on what we are as physios uh, and I'm also thinking that maybe we have focused on our internal work and our research and the methods and the theories and the things we do as physios instead of looking outside and maybe that's where we are now trying to look more externally um, than what we have um, been doing in when we look behind us um, and I would also when we met at uh, in Geneva and we um, talked about the Japanese motion then we also talked about prevention uh, because we as physios are talking a lot about prevention in terms of disease and health and illness, but maybe it's also time for us to think about prevention in terms of environment and sustainability. So thank you for now. Thank you, Cecilia. I uh, really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. And uh, Isi, I've seen that you've raised a hand. Uh, you can unmute your microphone and you can go into it. Hey, hi, I think I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, um, so I was just going to kind of comment on kind of what David was saying. Like, I really like the idea that, you know, maybe you don't have to make massive changes. The environment's already part of, of what we do kind of. I mean, as a student, my general gist of the profession isn't, you know, as broad as everybody else here, but kind of it's almost quite hopeful in a way thinking you know we don't have to make massive 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 steps to to you know change the profession it's just about bringing it all back to kind of its roots in a way and in finding finding the environment that's already in physio and not necessarily changing physio to to fit the environment in that kind of way yeah thank you <laughs> that's really great thanks you see uh and viviana um you're welcome to join in. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, Dave, for all. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Or we can hear you. Okay. So uh, I just think the same. Like um, with the, I think the environment hasn't been really uh, relevant uh, sometimes. I think we just uh, get our uh, spaces in a really little room or a, a hospital. And even like the same, I my husband is a landscape architect, so uh, they create design hospitals, and they said, why you work inside? Like why you cannot bring your patients outside and create areas that really support your work and not just in the corridors? That the way that we train, gate, and uh, like try to uh, rehab patients uh, is really restricted. So. He just said sometimes, like, and, and he works sometimes in that area in hospitals and, and mainly in landscapes. So he's tried to use the, this the environment in, in the community for people. And um, I just want to mention something that uh, came in the meeting with the Latin American uh, Critical Physiotherapy Group that we work on this editorial. And one of the reflections, because uh, for the South American people, it's very important the water like the rivers. So I think they came like, uh, maybe we need to bring our patients to the rivers because that is part of our culture. And um, I, yeah, I, I think we haven't really thought about it. it it's more like a aquatic physiotherapy in swimming pools, but uh, the river is part of the culture in our region. And I think that that was really important and kind of a new point of view and I think uh, in Norway they try to do that kind of outdoors uh, they have a special word for uh, uh, mining and trying to find ways in the nature so I think that physiotherapy ha has a really amazing field to explore to try to include the environment in the, in the therapies and that's it. thanks Viviana uh, I think the word is free lift leave. I'm also very new to Norway, so 
Yes, Cecilia is uh, nodding, so I've pronounced it halfway right. Um, <laughs> um, and next up, Amanda, if you want to unmute your microphone. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. Yeah, really echoing, I think, what everyone else is saying and some very obviously impressive people here. But um, I think hope is, is seems to be, you know, one that we're all kind of striving for. Um, and I'm really excited, I think, knowing, you know, physio is already environmental, but we can all do a little bit more. There's all this low hanging fruit that we can kind of be mindful of. Um, and I, uh, I'm just really excited. I have, you know, young kids and I want to be able to say at the end of the day that I'm doing my part. I'm like with everyone else, I'm encouraging this. I want to do everything that I can. Um, you know, we got the electric car, we have the forest, all that stuff. Um, we can all do that a little bit more. So mm. I'm, I'm excited to see kind of what happens with this group and, and all the great ideas that people have that we can share. Um, Canada is, a, you know, we generally don't toot the horn of physio very much. And I'm hoping that we can kind of use this to show everyone how amazing we all are. You're muted, yeah. Philip, at the minute. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Lucy, I'll get to you in a moment. I've seen your hand. Uh, and uh, Jane, yeah, if you want to um, go. Yeah. Hi, everybody. It's yeah. really fabulous to be part of this group and with you here today, um, the New Zealander in Scotland. Um, I think um, what the conversation so far has really got me thinking about is the way we reduced the body to the machine and we needed to isolate the body um, in our experiments and our research. And to do that, to put it in its little test tube, we removed the influences that we couldn't control. We removed the environment perhaps. Um, I wonder about that as a thought. Um, but in fact, we don't move without the provocation of the environment. We don't, um, we, we have muscles to get around to survive. And so the body, you know, the body, the environment um, have always been together. And I'm just really interested about, you know, we've, we manipulate the environment to stimulate movement. We do all sorts of things to get people moving. Um, we go on great marches to say the environment's wonderful. We empower people to move. Um, so I think my stance is, looking at that connection and strengthening. Um, I, I'm going to plant lettuces. I prefer being outdoors than in the gym. So um, personal motivation is definitely there, but I'm really interested in exploring perhaps where Dave has set us off today, looking at which rock has it got lost under and um, broadening our fingers, our, our reach, if you will, to encompass um, the interaction and then start to wonder, does this mean we're going to be occupational therapists? I think I'll leave it there. Thanks, Jane. Um, Karin, if you want to go next and unmute your microphone. Good evening, everybody. Yes, and I'm also Hi. so privileged to be here. Um, in contrast to Esther Mary, we had, don't have lots of water. We, and last time I told the others that the first time I became aware that natural resources are actually limited was already in primary school where there was awareness raising about saving water. So, um, but my stance in terms of what our role is, is to start really personal that we as I'm in public health, teaching public health, and I feel that we are, must always be the role models. We can't really tell people to do things if we don't do it. So first of all, I suppose us as physiotherapists needs to know how we can live environmentally responsible, and then also how we go about in our practices. Now, just practical things, how high is the air conditioning on? Um, do we have solar geysers and things like that? And then in terms of physiotherapy, it's all about well-being. And it is impossible to be well 
if your environment isn't also contributing to that. And I'm sure many of you also use the ICF, the International Classification of Functioning and Health, where as part of the concept is the environmental factors. So if we work in that framework also, it's absolutely part, part and parcel of physiotherapy because we want our clients to participate at the highest level. Thanks, Karin. And Lucy, uh, do you want to go? I will have to unmute your microphone just a moment. Um, I think let's try this. Yeah, say something now, Lucy. Okay. Good. Thank you, yeah. David and Philip, for the opportunity. I'm so excited to join this group. Okay, everybody have said that um, it's not really easy to tackle the issues that has to do with environmental sustainability as it relates to physiotherapy. Yes, that's true to a point, but it's just a little bit of change in our attitude that can make the magic. For instance, most of the equipment that we use generate emissions into the environment. So, even before we buy this equipment, we could check if they are energy efficient rated. And then our attitude towards the use of the equipment. When we finish treating our client, do we turn off these machines? Like sometimes we don't really need to use the air conditioner. For instance, one of the hospitals that I have worked, everybody just puts on the air conditioner. It's more of a thing of class or status than of humidify um, dehumidifying or cooling down the environment and these things generate a lot of heat something as simple as switching off the light bulbs after work helps to cool down the environment and because our work has to do with a lot of movement we ourselves generate a lot of heat our clients generate a lot of heat so for instance, we close the work after a long day. The next day, we now have to put on the AC or use the van to cool down the environment from our previous activity. So we have a lot of ways we can tackle the issues raised towards sustaining the environment. Another thing is the location of the physiotherapy hospitals or clinics. How accessible are they to our clients? How accessible are they to our colleagues? How are they? How accessible are they to, for in my country, like the low income earners? This one will curb the transportation, reduce the emission air pollution from the vehicles that we use, and then if it is really accessible to people, people don't have to drive their cars. They don't need to use public transport to get to the hospitals. They could take a walk. And, it's, and I mean, walking is part of the things we recommend to our client to stay healthy. So there are a lot of little approaches and change in attitude. We can do things we can do to really help with environmental sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. You might need to readjust your camera. Um, it's somehow gone all dark. I'm not sure if you can do something there. Um, and uh, Marion, um, I saw a hand from you. You want to turn off, turn on your microphone. Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be part of this today. I'm also really excited, and it's very inspiring. So um, I have thought very hard about what I'm going to say today, um, and a lot of things have resonated with me, especially um, Dave, because you're uh, you've got it all sorted in your mind, it seems. So. Um, I found that um, uh, I've been really interested in uh, movement ecology or um, what what the environment what what how the environment shapes our movement and how we have shaped our environment to um, you know to to make it all um, convenient you know which or which takes in a lot of resources from all over the world and reduces our ability to actually um, be in nature. And the other thing is that uh, I think we have um, in our culture separated ourselves 
from, um, or we believe we're separate from nature, um, physically and, and uh, mentally, and that has caused a lot of issues. So um, we don't see ourselves as part of, of the environment and we, we uh, as a wild animal, uh, we do not, um, like we don't think we are part of nature. So we don't believe we need everything that um, a wild animal would need like clean water, which um, draws on Viviana's um, point. Um, uh, lots of movement um, in, in nature and clean food. So, um, but this is kind of over, over towering uh, what that would mean for physiotherapy. So I have to kind of sort it in my head. Um, another thing is that our research has been informed um, by our worldview and by our culture, uh, Western culture. And um, I think that's what Jane meant. We, we took uh, the human body outside of the context and um, setting up lots of uh, experiments, um, kind of looking at the machine uh, while well, in real, in reality, we're influenced by by all the other um, aspects of of the environment. So I think um, a, a big chance is to kind of try to include all those questions into our uh, research uh, framework um, to make it a little bit more. Um, yeah, well, it's it's hard to kind of sort it all, all out uh, at the at that point, but I think. This is all to kind of flow into our research questions as well. Um, and what else? Yeah, uh, what, what I found really interesting, uh, the WCPTA motto is movement for health. And I think um, it should, or it could be a movement for planetary health. So that this is kind of included because our movement matters to the environment and our lack of movement causes lots of um, environmental issues. So I think that's where we could come in as physiotherapists. That's from me at the moment. Thanks. Thanks, Marion. That's fantastic. Um, I'll just uh, briefly check in with Tease. Tease, do you want to uh, add anything at this point? Um, I would need to hear your microphone is muted at the moment. You need to unmute it. And yeah, it should work now, right? Yeah, cool. OK, yeah. cool. Um, yeah. Um... I might, what I really like at this field is uh, the field of nature-based therapeutic interventions. And I also, right now I'm working on my bachelor thesis and it's uh, going to this topic and it's about nature-based uh, homework program that I provide for the patients with a chronic disease. And what, what I experienced in doing this uh, bachelor thesis that I have, have done that there's a big part of the environment that facilitates self-experience. So if when, when, when I told the patients or when I gave them a task that they um, have, uh, they can do in the, in the forest next by, for example, balancing or finding a tree to balance on, that um, gave them a huge variety in, um, yeah, in play and also in how to, how to find uh, the tree or where to go. And I think uh, it's really important that we see therapy really individualized and also see environments. Um, for some people, it's different or it's like important to know what environment is their favorite one to make them um, move more as well. So I can, I can say that um, it is a big part to, to actually make the patient see or experience the environment in a way that he can, that he has fun to spend time there. So for example, going on a walk and find this tree where he can balance on and that's fun for him, that, that could facilitate him to, to take this walk over and over again. And I think the environment and especially the environment that the patient can choose, like kind of some kind of nature, um, this is very important for self-experience and also to sustainable uh, to move in a way that is sustainable for a long time and fun as well. So, thank you. Thanks, Tees. That was very good. Um, I'll just unmute your mic. Oops. Yep. Unmute your microphone. I'll just squeeze myself in here briefly before coming around to Cecilia and then Issy again. Um, 
I've got two a uh, number of things in mind. Time is really running. Uh, there's so many of us, and there's so much to talk about. And on the one hand, I want to uh, uh, say let's try and have another round of everyone saying something, uh, but we'll have to sort of be brief. At the same time, I thought I'm just going to crash in with a wave of things and um, and see what that does to our conversation. <laughs> um, so um, I I think that you know. Um, in, 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 in certain, I, I really also, you know, like Dave has pointed out, I think that very much the environment is ultimately, this is a very important point. I think the environment is implicated in everything that we do. One of the key things to do and that we have to do now and quickly and clearly is to gain an understanding of how that is the case in everything that we do. So in some ways, there is some research work to be done there. Um, and for that to happen, of course, we need the support of our departments, of our universities and so forth. And I think we're at a moment in time where we are actually quite likely to get that kind of support slowly. And I think it's very important that we um, push for that. In the same way, also uh, latching on to something that um, Esther Mary said in the beginning, I think uh, these issues, the same motion that's been put forward to the WCPT by the Japanese Association, I think we need to think about, you know, we need to teach our current and future students starting as of now about the sustainable development goals, about planetary health, about sustainable healthcare, about what environmental physiotherapy should be. And this is not, hey, let's plan it for some other time, but it's like, you know, yesterday. So um, when, when there is a lot of knowledge out there already. It's not like we have to start from some kind of vacuum. Um, we can really get going and then try to understand how it even more, you know, applies to us. Um, there's also, you know, Amanda mentioned the low hanging fruit. There's some very clear things that, you know, we can do individually, but also maybe as a profession, you know, we have to see how maybe our footprint in some aspects is quite low, but in other things we might reduce still things, you know. So those are really important points. I also want to say one point with regard to the sustainable development goals, which I believe will be very, very important, you know, for us uh, going forward. Um, I'm on board essentially, um, and um, I, I'm for us trying to engage more with the sustainable development goals and um, investing in some kind of implementation. My concern is that um, I kind of want to caution against uh, us developing an attitude by which implementation of the SDGs means that we've done our due and all is well. I think the SDGs, um, you know, uh, sustainability as a term and development as a term are currently resting on a decade or two of also some quite intense critique and we need to from the very beginning of engaging with these things also engage with their critique so we need to you know not just be adopters which i think physiotherapists have some history of being so i would like us to not start and continue in this area in the same way in which we have adopted the biomedical model for example previously it's kind of my little take on the, you know, sustainable development goals, a very sort of quick one. Uh, I've posted a few things on Twitter via the uh, EPA um, um, account as well in this regard earlier today. I'll stop here because I'd really like to give uh, more others again a chance to share. Um, yes, and so moving on to Cecilia. Um, thank you very much for that. I was I was thinking a little about a bit about that we are representing uh, different uh, contexts and we have different uh, opportunities to uh, to make an impact or to change things. Uh, I'm representing the trade union in Sweden, where we have uh, physiotherapists all over the country who are our members, and what we have been trying. To to do is that we are trying to focus the environmental issues in our work, both internally within the association, but also externally. You have been talking about, um, we have been talking about prevention and physical activity and using the nature as treatment and so on. And, but we have also tried to, to widen the concept and not talking about the environment, but also talking about sustainability in terms of health and in terms of the working environments and the conditions that we work within. And uh, this year we are, um, we are preparing for our general meeting that will be in November next year. And then we are posing these questions to 
all our members and all the people that follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And so what are your thoughts about uh, sustainable uh, health wor working conditions, sustainable health, and how can we how can we work on this together? So I think that's one of, uh, as an association, that's one of our responsibilities to, to focus these issues and try to, to, to make the members aware and also show that we are, we are living as we speak, so to say. And I will also be interested to hear a little bit more from Esther Mary, maybe, how you are working within the ERWCPT with these issues. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia. Um, um, we'll just skip to Liv. I've sort of jumped over her in the first round. Olivia, if you want to unmute your microphone. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Hi. I just want to say, um, I was listening to Cecilia and opportunities and what you said, Philip, about teaching, and I'm in a very fortunate position in that um, I am a director of clinics for Otago University, so we throughput um, the students through our clinic. So one of the reasons I'm so excited about being here is that we have a chance to help make environmentally aware health professionals. So we have a chance to impact on the next generation that is coming through, and we're really excited about that. Um, I think we're, we're starting off small because it's you know, baby steps at a time, but um, I think things like um, focusing on teaching our students to use the environment and being uh, mindful of what we're actually living in and the, imp uh, the impact the environment has actually on us as humans when we take our patients out into nature um, and the difference that that can have. Uh, I'm hoping to help promote um, our students to maximize the use of the outside environment. So we live in New Zealand and we are very lucky to have a um, beautiful environment that we can use and access to lots of beautiful parks. The other thing that I think um, that we're going to start doing in the clinic and that we've had our students already um, feeding us back on areas that they thought that we could make a difference and and some of these are quite simple the sustainability uh, stuff within the practice um, for example I'm at a university and we're a really paper heavy environment so we're starting to minimize a, a lot of the paper that we're, we're asking do we actually need that paper we're going to have to kill a tree to use that do we want to commit to that or we can, can we do it another way um, even things like our paper cups, we're looking at replacing all of those with little glass ones and students are quite happy to do more washing apparently. <laughs> um, um, the other thing I think too is that um, overall we are quite used to looking at the environment and looking at the effect that it has on other beings, so animals for example. We look at when we're, we're studying a different species, this is part of my primatology kicking in here, we think nothing at all of analyzing the environment and thinking how is this affecting this particular animal and the way it moves and the way it lives and you know from a rehab point of view how does that affect the the animal as it's recovering we don't really do this to humans we don't really look out there and think um is our, our allocations appropriate what does it what does it mean um can the weather make a big difference and actually you know the weather does make a huge difference to us as humans and little things like teaching our students that um, we need to be aware of these sorts of things with our clients and you're right um, I can't remember who somebody said uh, I think it was this is it said about taking your patient out and letting them touch a tree you know putting someone in tune with nature while they're exercising is very relaxing and it's mindful and I think we don't um, exploit this enough because this is natural this is the way we are and I think rehab and I think our students will benefit from learning to a integrate with nature and b try to minimize the impact that we have so yeah thank you very much thanks Olivia um, just going to jump in with a small point here I've just been in touch with another member of uh, the environmental physiotherapy association and it was pointed out to me that there are certain contexts this is a context that this uh, colleague is working in where as a result of some uh, insurance issues, she is not allowed to take her patients outside. So on the note of this sort of area of thinking, I think it's really interesting that, well, maybe then, you know, some of our task is also to advocate and make a case for why that is important. Then we need to be able to, of course, you know, reason that or justify and so forth. And there's an interesting problem also to keep in mind and to explore. And yeah, it was just, uh, it was highlighted to me two days ago or one day ago, in fact, and so just seemed to fit here. 
Um, all right, uh, moving on to Issy again. Yeah, that was um, really interesting, actually, to to hear about it from kind of an educator's point of view. Obviously, I'm on the other end of that, and I do really think there's there's a hunger almost among students to be given, not necessarily handed on a plate the tools to to change their practice, but kind of given the guidance and and I guess yeah the the tools to influence how we do then qualify and become actual physiotherapists um, to make that practice from the very beginning, you know, as, as environmentally positive as it can be. Um, I've chatted a lot with Thies um, about kind of not just the sustainable side of, of physio, but also the positive impact that the environment has on patients. Um, even like just at the moment, I'm on a stroke ward and there are patients there that sometimes the only thing we'll do with them is just take them outside. Because, you know, being in a hospital absolutely sucks. And sometimes the change of environment is going to have such a bigger impact on your rehab than, you know, hammering at that Zimmer frame for a bit longer. Um, and I think when we're discussing how we can include the environment in physio it's great you know obviously we need to make a difference we need to make it more sustainable we need to you know cut down on our single-use plastics and all of that but I think it's really important that we we also take into account the the positive effect that the environment can have on on our patients and encouraging our patients to engage in their environment as a thought like a form of therapy really I think you know getting outside with a patient if you can um is, is going to make much much more difference to their lives than than us you know walking them around the intensive care unit for a bit um and i think definitely then having the the multiple aspects and influences in what we're describing environmental physiotherapy as is you know fundamental for it, it, it engaging as many people as possible Thanks, Issy. Um, uh, David, do you want to unmute your microphone? Um, thanks, Philip. Oh, my goodness, I've got so many things in my head. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is something that's really, I think, philosophically important to me in all of this, and it's this question of human hubris. And I think we have to keep coming back to this question. Um, there is a tendency in thinking about in a space like this to think of ourselves as um, what we can do, how we can intervene to make things better. And this is a problem. And this is a problem for quite a lot of contemporary writers. Um, I just went and got a couple of books. I'd recommend, if you don't know this person, Tim Morton. I'm I'll put the references up to this guy um, later on. One of the things that Tim Morton argues is that the biggest problem is that we think we can fix this, that we want to intervene more. And that is the classic enlightenment way to think that humans are the, uh, can intervene in nature, can command it and control it. And what people like Tim Morton argues is that that's the cause of the environmental problems. Um, and just, just relating to that comment about the insurance companies not letting people take patients outside this is a question of risk isn't it this is a question of risk that the insurance companies um, want to manage we need to manage the environment and they don't want to carry the risk of the patient falling or having something go wrong with them and that idea that we can control the environment and so the patient must be in a sterile hospital ward or is very much akin to the idea that a patient shouldn't be in a natural environment. They must be studied in a clinical trial or an RCT. This is the biomedical model at play. And this is the model that physiotherapy has historically bought into completely. And so we are um, imply, we are complicit in the kind of environmental degradation, not just because of our turning a, uh, an air conditioner on, it's because philosophically physiotherapy has been built on a kind of reductive rationale that is anti-environmental. It's not about the natural world. It's about stripped away, abstracted people in clinically sterile situations. And that's one of the issues that we have to tackle. So it's more than just about turning air conditioners off. Um, one of the things that we have at our fingertips, and this goes back to a point that Philip was saying earlier on, is we have all of these critiques available to us. 
Um, if you read Karl Marx, for instance, one of the key things that Marx talks about is the process that industrialization alienates people from their communities. It takes people, them away, takes people away from the place where they're born and where they live and puts them into abstract places where they become the machinery of capitalism and production. And in a sense, Marx can already give us clues as to the ways we need to change and become more environmental and less capitalistic. And biomedical, the biomedical model is tied implicitly to capitalism. And so there's not surprisingly then a, a parallel critique between our affluence and um, Lucy's thing comment about air conditioning um, and our affluence and it being about a class and a status issue to turn the air conditioners on absolutely to ca catches on to that point. So I think maybe for me, one of the things that's most exciting about this group and to, to extent to an extent as well, the critical physio network is they're both reflecting what I think is perhaps the most significant change in physiotherapy this millennium, which is this idea that we are now starting to look at the social context in which physiotherapy operates, the social in the broadest sense, the cultural context, the environmental context, the places where people live, connecting people with their communities, thinking more broadly than just the abstracted person in a clinical trial in a, in a white walled clinic room. And that looking outward which is the theme of the, our second critical physio book, and less navel gazing and less controlling, less governed and managed and more freedom. Maybe one of the most important things about moving towards a, a different environmental politics for physiotherapy. Thanks, Dave. Um, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm a little bit conscious of time. Um, I would. I, I, I love the conversation so far. I think um, that um, we probably realistically have about three more short speakers, um, maybe four. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, just with, with that in mind, um, Viviana, I had a hand from you. I, I agree with Dave, and I think that um, uh, I, I read something about the social determinants of health. I think there is something more to do about environmental determinants of health and how we can advocate, like you said, like in South America, the air pollution is everywhere. And that really affects the patient. Like if there is no really good quality of air, what, what else do you want? And that really, it gets advo advocated. Uh, we need to advocate all the professions in health but we, I think we haven't done it and it's something that needs to be done uh, academically, like try to educate our students to get that power of advocacy. And um, the other thing that I've been thinking is about technology and I, I really love the work of Donna Hathaway and uh, like how we think about like when we use like, the technology and what happened with the rubbish that we produce doesn't matter what is it. And um, like, just for example, the teravans, like where the teravans are going, they are plastic and they just end up like a really robot, really horrible thing. And uh, it's something that, that, that uh, we can do a lot of technology to really change that kind of materials of the teravans. It can be the same accessible, easy to use, but can be another kind of advocate to try to get people in, that, in those companies that produce that kind of material to do it like in a way that is going to be re like recycled or can be destroyed and in a more environmental way. And the same, I think about the cardiopulmonary work, like uh, when I, I graduated in 2000, we managed like bottles and we sterilized those bottles but it was very rudimentary. But now with all those machines, we don't know really where those flames are going. They just get encapsulated in those containers, but where are they going? So all those like thinking, what happened with the rubbish? Uh, uh, not just what we are doing in the normal environment. So what we are producing and where is it going? Uh, so that's my Thanks, Viviana. I suppose the short answer is nothing goes anywhere, um, but uh, <laughs> maybe we just need to be aware of that a little bit more. I've got Esther Mary and Liv um, 
uh, about two minutes each, maybe, if that's okay. Esther Mary, um, if you go next. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, maybe just in reverse order, I've just really three points. Um, one is with regard to Viviana's um, coming in there to think of the figures, because <clears throat> already 70% of people in Europe live in cities. And by 2050, uh, 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 sorry, well, two thirds of people in, um, live in cities in Europe. By 2050, 70% of the world population will live in cities. And that is really um, a frightening thought. And also that 75,000 people die uh, each year in Europe from nitrogen dioxide, which is obviously mostly diesel vehicles. And we who work in respiratory physiotherapy have a big issue there. We talked about prevention earlier, so that's, that's something uh, to look at. One other point um, Cecilia mentioned about the European region, I think we could be doing more. Um, and I suppose that's why I'm so interested in this group. Um, I also think that there's an enormous amount of expertise here and that we should be looking at something like um, a module, including the students who are here um, to design that module um, and perhaps some guidelines as well. I know David mightn't think that's the answer, but I think in terms of perhaps some concrete um, evidence of, of, of the collective here. And lastly, I'm just going to make a plug, but I think two things, the European Region Congress is on education in September, 2020. Uh, it's the abstracts are open and perhaps we could put something in there like a module to put on the on the literally to hand to the educationalists and say include this module in your curriculum from today onwards okay and perhaps a focused symposium for the WCPT meeting in Dubai um in, in 20 how to get this right 2021 thank you thanks sister mary and uh, olivia Hi, I just wanted to add one thing because I, uh, I think it's quite exciting. We're just beginning to bring in telehealth into our clinic um, and we will be rolling it out with our students doing the telehealth <laughs> next year. So there are two reasons that this is exciting. A, um, it's reducing uh, the use of our resources. So it's preventing people getting on their cars and coming into the city and having to pay to use, be in the car parks and then come in and use the resources within the clinic. But more importantly, and I think that this is um, key here, is that it's empowering your patient and it's giving them the chance that they can just basically ring in and they can seek some guidance and they can become um, a bit more independent in their own home and their own environment. So we're giving a way that they can feel more supported within their own community without having to come out of their normal environment and get plonked into something sterile. So the idea is, yes, they will still have to come in to see us occasionally, but if we can be there and we can help them do their own thing and develop in their own space, then we're hoping to be a bit more successful. Thanks, Olivia. That's fantastic. Um, so uh, maybe, um, yeah, if somebody else uh, has, has uh, a comment, um, I suppose we do have time for one more person to add something. I'll give you a moment to consider if you if there is nothing anyone wants to add, I'll probably close us off. But yeah, if you, if you want to say anything in addition to what's been said in the last round. Lucy, I just, yeah. I just want to say. Yeah. Uh, Lucy, we need to unmute your microphone. Yeah. Yep. Okay, from everyone's discussion, it's obvious that we are all relating with environmental sustainability from different points of view, different culture, and different parts of the world. I think we could come up with a model working together with the United Nations Call for Action on interdisciplinary approaches to environmental sustainability issues and challenges, and then work together with the WCPT and come up with some, something concrete because it's a very wide field. Try to streamline it to what we can do and achieve one at a time. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Lucy. Um, 
Okay, so I, th I think that um, I will kind of, uh, yeah, um, um, maybe, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll add one more point. No, I won't. I'll, I'll let us close here. Uh, it, it would be too much going off into a next thing. And uh, just like Lucy said, you know, this is uh, really, uh, it's all a lot. And, you know, hopefully we're making some kind of start. But Dave, would you want to say a word or two just to close us off before I do a final roundup? Uh, just to say thank you to everybody for their openness and their sharing and their, the time that they've given. It was so lovely to have this conversation with people. Thanks, Dave. Um, okay, so um, again, thank you to all uh, participants and viewers alike. We've had a few people watching uh, and also there's been a few people uh, commenting, uh, at least from what I can see sort of on the side on YouTube. I'm not sure, you know, let's see uh, how the discussion continues. Um, I also have to say a really special thank you to Professor Anne-Marit Mengshul and actually the whole Department of Interdisciplinary Health Sciences um, at the medical faculty of the University of Oslo um, for their really cordial support. They've provided me with a guest desk for the last few months. And this has been a significant help in setting up the Environmental Physiotherapy Association, first of all, and also uh, today's roundtable. Uh, I am at the department as we speak. Um, and um, yeah, so for me, this was uh, really inspiring. It was everything I hoped for and more. Um, I hope we've made a good start, a good introduction into, um, into um, yeah, this discussion, the conversation, into introducing greater environmental awareness and responsibility into our profession, and also thinking about sort of the broader, the social aspects of environmental sustainability and sustainability in general and so forth. I think we've touched on many really good points and, and good points that we can continue from. Um, and, um, yeah, for me, uh, also, again, uh, like I said in the beginning, I think uh, a key message for me remains that environmental physiotherapy or whatever we want to call it, really, um, it's, you know, it's just a moniker at the moment, but whatever we want to call it, it's a really wide open field. Uh, but we also have these some, some kind of quite concrete action points, you know, that we can latch on to. And at a baseline, I think what this means is that we need to expand our you know view a little bit our, our horizon a little bit so that you know we just move away from those previously somewhat limited concerns to maybe a more broader a more planetary a more global uh ethics i'm not sure what you were holding up there um is to mary i'm sorry <laughs> um and um so um next i think after recognizing that we need to get working in my opinion on all sorts of fronts at the same time, rather than just one or two. That's probably my take on what Lucy was just saying. You know, there's many of us, uh, we've got, we have different expertises. We can get working in all sorts of ways. Having, keeping in mind what Dave said about getting to work and also what I actually philosophically am prone to working or not working. Um, and, um, I think we also have to ensure that the, that the field stays open because things are going to change and keep moving and we need to be able to adjust and adapt and, you know, let's not close it down too quickly, for example, but just limiting it to implementing the SDGs, you know, or any other example. Um, and I think this is also underscored in the recent Lancet report uh, in so far as it clearly said that we need the work of 7.5 billion people in order to, you know, yeah, I don't know, we can't say solve, but I don't know, anyway, address or respond to what we're looking at at the moment. Um, and um, yeah, I think this roundtable provides a really good basis that we can continue, you know, thinking on. Uh, I hope to see that environmental and sustainability perspective become a staple in physiotherapy, clinical practice and education and research at undergraduate levels, at postgraduate levels on the agendas of our local, national, regional, and national professional organizations, and of course, also the WCPT very soon. Um, that's kind of my, my, my roundup thematically, I suppose. As far as some final um, housekeeping is concerned, please remember that the YouTube video uh, should be available for viewing practically immediately. Uh, if something doesn't turn out that way, I'll try to sort it out very quickly. 
you can then, for viewers, comment uh, underneath the video once you've watched it or while you're watching it or be just before you turn it off. <laughs> and um, you can also, of course, you know, and we would love that, join and continue the conversations using the hashtag or any other means. Um, if you wanted to join the Environmental Physiotherapy Association or other uh, similar efforts, like, for example, hashtag Physiotherapists for Future that I should also mention here that are based in Sweden at the moment, but should be probably be based everywhere in some way. Um, yeah, please do that. Um, hopefully, you know, if you want to help us advance an environmentally aware and responsible physiotherapy, um, you know, get in touch. And whether you join or not, let us know if you're working on anything related to sustainability and environmental physiotherapy, most broadly speaking. We're really, as far as the website of the association is concerned, I'm not necessarily looking to build some kind of knowledge base, but maybe an inspiration base, showcasing a colorful palette of, of all that environmental physiotherapy could be. So I would love to feature whoever's work and uh, even, even then maybe especially all the things that I don't agree with or would take to differently <laughs> and um, yeah so um, with that I will close the round table by just saying again that I truly believe that we're facing as great a challenge as we're facing an opportunity and that for this opportunity I really believe the time is now so thank you for your time again and uh, hopefully we'll see you again shortly thanks to all <laughs> And we're just ending the live stream now.